Welcome to this YSL Excel VBA tutorial. This video shows you how to add text to shapes and it's a direct follow-on from the previous two videos in the series which explained how to draw shapes on a worksheet and then how to format those shapes. This video focuses on working with shape text and we'll begin by looking at how to add basic text to an existing shape. When we do that we'll need to give you a quick overview of the text frame and text frame 2 objects so that you're aware of the differences between them and know which one you should be working with. We'll then move on and look at a few shapes that are designed specifically for working with text, text boxes, labels and word art shapes. Then the second half of the video is going to focus on formatting the text that you've added. So we'll look at some basic font formatting properties such as the font size and bold and italic properties etc. We'll look at text orientation and alignment and then finally right at the end of the video we'll look at a couple of the fancier effects such as glow, reflection and shadow effects. OK, so to get started, all I've done so far is created a brand new blank Excel workbook and I've already saved it as a macro enabled workbook called Shape Text. From here, I'm going to head to the Developer tab and then straight into the Visual Basic Editor. And then in there, I'm going to head to the Project Explorer window, right click and choose to insert a new module. And I'm going to start by setting up a quick simple subroutine that will help me later on in the video just to delete all the existing shapes on Sheet 1. So let's create a new sub called Delete Sheet 1 Shapes or something along those lines. And then we can do this in a couple of different ways. You may have watched the previous video on formatting shapes. We could write a for each loop to loop over all of the individual shapes on sheet one and delete each one individually. But it's somewhat more convenient to just do this in two simple lines of code. If I say sheet one dot shapes dot select all, that will of course, as the name suggests, select all the shapes on sheet one. I can then refer to the selection and then simply apply the delete method and that'll get rid of them in two lines of code rather than more than that. So that's a nice quick simple way to get started. What I'm also going to do while I'm here is create a new subroutine that's going to add a basic rectangular shape. So I'm going to create a new sub um, and this one's going to be called something simple like add basic text. And I'll give that a capital B as well rather than a lowercase b. Not that it really matters other than to allow me to sleep tonight. So add basic text. I'm going to declare a variable dim s as shape and then I'm going to set, uh, first of all, big part, I'm going to delete all the old shapes. So I'm going to call the routine that I've just created, delete sheet one shapes. And then I'm going to set S to be equal to sheet1.shapes.addShape. And the particular kind of shape I'm going to add is going to be an MSO shape rectangle. I'll spell that properly. There we go. MSO shape rectangle. I'm going to set its left position to 20 points, its top position to 20 points, its width to 200, and its height to 100. Having done that, we're basically at the position where we can now start adding text to that shape. Now to start adding text to a shape, I first of all need to refer to the container of text within the shape, and that's referred to as a text frame. So to begin with, let's say s dot, and then look for the text frame property for the shape object. Now you'll notice there are two different text frames available. There's text frame, which is the old fashioned version, and text frame two, which is the, the all singing, all dancing modern version that was released in Office 2007. Now text frame 2 has a few extra properties and methods for doing fancy things with formatting and orienting text which we'll look at a little bit later on in the video. But just to show you that the, te the old text frame property does still work, well let's begin with that one. So to add text using text frame I'd have to say s.textframe and then another full stop and refer to the characters method within there. The characters method returns a reference to the characters within the text frame and then to set the text of those characters, and it's a little bit long-winded, appreciated, I can set the text property to be equal to the bit of text that I want. So for this example I'll just enter a simple little bit of literal text. Um, I know every programming manual I've ever read always makes you say hello world as the first message which I just find horribly boring. So uh, in fact let's just enter the word boring. There we go. So having done that, if I were to run that subroutine, I'll end up with a new simple rectangle on the on the sheet with the word boring sitting in it. The text frame 2 property does something very very similar. Let's just comment out the s.textframe statement and instead let's replace it with s.textframe2. Now text frame 2 doesn't have a characters method. What it has instead is a text range property. But from that point on things are pretty much the same so I can say text range dot text and then I can make that equal to uh, well that's still pretty boring isn't it so let's say still boring just to demonstrate that it does create a separate a different shape so if I were to run that subroutine this original shape will be deleted and the new one will be created so there we go still boring 
Now just before we go any further it's worthwhile mentioning that although most types of shapes that you can draw on a worksheet can have text added to them and most of those shapes can use both text frame and text frame 2 as we've just seen some shapes aren't allowed to use the text frame 2 property. Just let me give you a quick example of that. I'm going to copy and paste this subroutine we've just written and I'm going to add an example of a shape that can't use the text frame 2. So let's create a new subroutine called add form button, something along those lines. That gives you a bit of a clue about the type of shape we're about to add. So I'm going to change the line that says set s equals. Rather than adding a shape, what I'm going to do instead is remove that and say add form control. And if I open some parentheses, the first thing I have to do when, when I use the add form control method is choose exactly which type of control to add. So I'm going to use the default or the first option in the list there, an Excel button control. What I can then do is set the left and the top properties, so let's set that to 20 and 20. Then the width, uh, we don't need to make it quite as large as the text box we've just created. Let's make the width 100 and the height 50, something simple like that. Okay, so I've, I've got it in here at the moment where it's still saying s.textframe2.textrange.text. Let's make it something more button-like. Let's call it something like click me. And then if I were to run that subroutine, I'm going to end up with a runtime error. If I click the debug button, it will hopefully show me, of course, that it's failed on the line where the text is trying to be changed. So I've drawn the button, I just can't change the text using text frame 2. So let's just reset the procedure by clicking the reset button at the top. And then let's comment out the text frame 2 uh, property and refer to the original text frame characters text. And again, let's change this so it says click me. And then if we just run the subroutine this time, you'll see that we do indeed now have a button that has the phrase click me written onto it. So um, just to bear in mind that some shapes can't use text frame too, you must use text frame for the old fashioned shapes. Now, although you can add text to most shapes that you can draw on a worksheet, there are a couple of shape types that are designed specifically for containing text. One's called a text box and the other is called a label. So just to very quickly demonstrate how those work, I'm going to make a copy of my subroutine that adds basic text. Let's copy that and then paste it in a bit further down. I'm also going to give myself a few blank lines below just to make it a little bit easier for you guys to read. So let's call this one add basic text box and label just to distinguish it from the previous routines. So we've got a shape variable, we can delete all the existing shapes, but this time rather than adding a shape, what we're going to do is add a text box. So let's remove the add shape method and replace that with add text box. So you see there's a separate dedicated method for that. So if I open up a set of parentheses, I don't need to choose what type of shape I'm adding, unlike the add shape method, it's kind of the hints in the name of the method, I suppose, add text box. What I do have to do is specify what text orientation I'd like. So let's go with text orientation downward, just for the sake of argument, this is the first one. I'll change the width, uh, the, the left and the top properties as usual, 20 and 20, and the width 200 and the height 100. We could use either text frame or text frame 2 for this. I'll stick with the still boring text. If I were to run that subroutine, you'll see hopefully I get the still boring text box. Um, it's got a white fill color, you can see. So it's uh, the, the formatting is slightly different for text boxes compared to other types of auto shapes. I can do the same thing with the text frame method as well, of course. So I comment out the text frame two and then use the text frame property. So I should have said rather than rather than method. And then if I run that subroutine, you'll see that that creates another text box with the word boring. So again, text frame and text frame two completely interchangeable for a text box. Now labels work in basically exactly the same way, it's just the end result is ever so slightly different. It, the parameter list for the add label method is in fact exactly the same as that for the add text box method. So let's replace add text box with add label. And then let's just change the orientation of the text as well. So we're not going for downward this time, let's go with MSO orientation, let's go with upward instead. I've got the uh, the top and left properties or the left and top parameters set 20 and 20. I've set a width of 200 and a height of 100. So those parameters are exactly the same. If I click somewhere inside the parentheses and hit control I to display the IntelliSense list, you'll see that the add label method has exactly the same list of parameters. Again, I can use either text frame or text frame 2 for a label. So let's just run, uh, run that subroutine again. And you'll see that the end result this time is somewhat different. So a label doesn't come along with a background color. It has a transparent fill and no outline. If I clicked into the label, you can also see that the size of it is somewhat smaller than I specified as well. So the width is only as wide as it needs to be for the text that I'm 
entering into it. That's dependent on the orientation of the text. If I just switch back to the Visual Basic Editor again, and if I change the orientation back to its original uh, horizontal orientation, so I've got a, a width of 200 and a height of 100, and if I were to run that one again, you'll see this time that the width has been set to 200, but the height definitely isn't 100 anymore. So the actual size of the label depends on how much text you've added to it. I can again interchange this with the uh, the text frame and text frame 2 properties, so let's just quickly demonstrate that that's the case. If I take away the text frame 2 and replace it with, uh, sorry, I take away text frame and replace it with text frame 2 and then run the subroutine again, it does exactly the same thing. Now, although labels work slightly differently to the other shapes, with text boxes there's really no massive advantage to using a text box over and above a basic rectangular auto shape. The one advantage that you do have, I suppose, with a text box is that you get to set the orientation of the text when you first create it. But that can be changed afterwards anyway, using another property of the object. So you're not really losing out anything by, by using a simple text, uh, sorry, a simple rectangle rather than a text box. They're pretty much the same sort of control. There is one final method I'd like to show you for adding text to a worksheet, but rather than adding text to an existing shape, it's going to add a shape which is, in itself, text. You may be familiar already with the idea of word art. If I head to the Insert tab in the ribbon, there's an option in there for word art. You don't tend to see it very much anymore, but it used to be all the rage back in the 1990s. You couldn't open a PowerPoint presentation or a Word document without seeing somebody's inserted some word art. So what we're going to do is show you the code you can write to add that to your worksheet. So let's switch back to the VB editor again, and let's have a new subroutine. In fact, I'm just going to copy and paste the add basic text box and label routine um, just to keep things a little bit quicker and simpler. Let's call this one something like add word art. Well, it's anything but artistic in my own humble opinion, but there we go. And I'm going to add a variable, delete all sheet one shapes, and then I'm just going to take away. Um, I'm going to take away all this after the shapes dot element. So. What I'm going to do this time, sheet1.shapes.add text effect. So it's a completely separate method for adding word art. And there are quite a few parameters to fill in for this one. So I'm going to split this across multiple different lines just so that you can see exactly what we're doing. So if I open the parentheses and then type in a, a space followed by an underscore and then hit enter, I'm going to set the preset text effect first of all. In fact, I'm going to name these parameters as well just so you can see a little more clearly what we're doing. So the preset text effect parameter I'm going to set to be, I'm going to choose just because, I, because I've tested this one and I know this one works, MSO text effect 27 and there are quite a few of these. Feel free to try out a few more. There are more in this list than you'll see from the drop down menu on the insert tab in the ribbon, that's for sure. So text effect 27, then a comma, space, underscore, and then on the next line I'm going to set the actual text of the word art. So I know something uh, like nostalgia isn't what it used to be. I should have picked something shorter. Anyway, there we go. And then another method, we've got to specify the font name. So as we're going for the 90s, let's set the font name to be equal to Comic Sans. Um, to enter that, we've got to pass this in as a string. So we're going to say Comic Sans, and it's full official title. It's Comic Sans MS. So there you go. There's maybe something you didn't know. So then a comma, space, underscore. What else have we got to do? We've got to specify the font size. So let's set the font size parameter. Quite a few things to fill in for a lot of effort for something that's not particularly <laughs> attractive as the end result. Let's set that to 18. And then we've also got font bold, font italic, left and top. So let's just go for uh, font bold equals false and font sorry MSO false and then font italic also false I just want it to be in its standard hideous glory and then nearly there big pardon that should have been an underscore rather than a dash the next one I'm going to set the left parameter to be equal to 20 again and then finally the top parameter to be equal to 20 so you don't have to specify a height and a width for word art. It's set based on the amount of text you've typed in and the font size, of course. So if I close the parentheses at that point, if I were to just run this one, we'll end up with a fairly... Eh, <laughs> it's not the most attractive kind of looking text, is it? But there you go. There's, there's word art. You can add text to your documents using word art, as well as just adding text to basic shapes. So now that we know how to add text to a shape, let's have a look at some of the basic things you can do to format that text. 
let's just scroll back up to find my add basic text routine and I'm going to copy this one into a new module just to keep things a little neater and tidier than normal so I'm going to select that subroutine copy it then insert a new module and then paste that code back in I'll change the name of the subroutine so it's called something like format basic text and then what I'm going to do is add a new rectangle shape in the same way as I have previously. I'm also going to change the back colour or the fill colour for the shape as well. So you may remember if you've watched the previous video that we spent a lot of time looking at how to change fill colours for shapes. Just so we've got a plain white fill colour, I'm going to say s.fill.forcolor.rgb equals, and then we're going to set that, to, I'm going to set mine to RGB white. I'm also going to change the, the text that I'm going to add into the, the shape. So rather than sticking with something <laughs> that is indeed still boring, um, let's, uh, let's, I'm going to stick in the name of the last film that I watched. So last night I watched a film called uh, Kung Fu Killer with Donnie Yen. I think it's also called Kung Fu Jungle maybe in the States. I can't remember. Um, anyway, it was, was alright. It was uh, pretty good. It's not quite as good as, good as uh, the Ip Man films. But, um, but yeah, it was alright. It's worth a watch if you like your Kung Fu movies. So, having added that basic text into the shape, if I just run that subroutine just to demonstrate that that's what will happen, but of course I can't see the text because the default font colour is white on a white background, what we now need to do is format the text so it will actually be readable. Now there are lots and lots of different properties you can change to format text. I'm going to start by doing this with the text frame 2 property rather than text frame. So what I'm going to do is, because I'm going to change quite a lot of properties of the same object, I'm going to refer, I'm going to use a width block, so I'm going to say width s.textframe2 dot text range dot font and then I'm going to end my width a couple of lines further down and then inside there I can set up lots of different properties for the font. I guess first of all we should sort out the colour of the font. That's a, that takes a little bit more effort so I'm going to say um, inside the, the width block I'm going to say dot font dot fill dot for colour essentially exactly the same as the, the fill colour of the actual shape itself so font dot fill dot for colour dot RGB. Now, if you watch the previous video on formatting shapes, there's an awful lot of information in there about how to set colors or choose colors. So we saw in the previous video there was something called an object theme color, which allows you to choose one of the colors from the standard themes. So if you go to the home tab in the ribbon, for instance, and select a cell or select an object and look at the theme colors, if you use the fill color tool or the font color tool, you get a list of available theme colors that have specific names. So I've got a background one colour and then I've got a, a text one colour and so on and so on and so on. Now one of the issues with theme colours or maybe one of the advantages of theme colours is that if I were to choose the accent one colour here which is currently blue in this particular theme and then if I were to subsequently change the theme of my document from the page layout tab I've got themes if I change the theme then that could change the font colour or the accent one colour that I've already already selected. So there are potential problems with using theme colours that they can change automatically if you uh, if you change the theme of the document. So for that reason I'm going to use the RGB colour. One of the other options in there as well by the way was if I just bring back the IntelliSense the scheme colour which is a somewhat more old-fashioned way to do this. So I'm not going to use scheme colours. RGB is a sensible choice for picking a, a specific fixed colour. Now the RGB property allows you to specify essentially just a number, so this number must be within the range 0 to 16,777,215, that's the actual range of numbers you're allowed to use. Each one corresponds to a slightly different colour. So I could just randomly type in a number between that range, um, I don't know, that number would generate a particular colour, so in fact if I run the subroutine at this point by hitting F5, there we go, some kind of murky yellowy brownish colour. There are slightly more convenient ways to set colors. So you saw up here, I've used a property called, or sorry, a constant called RGB white. So there's a whole range of RGB colors, it's named colors. If I press control and space here after the equals and look for RGB in my list, I've got a list of RGB colors, all with wonderfully flowery names. So let's go with something, I don't know, let's go with RGB hot pink. And then if I run the subroutine again, I'll see that Kung Fu Killer is in this lovely shade of hot pink now. One other way to set the RGB values is if you have a particular corporate brand to specify. So if you have um, a brand identity where you've got a specific list of colours you're allowed to use, frequently those colours are defined with RGB values. So again, if I set up uh, the RGB property of the four colour, of the fill of the font of the text range of text frame 2, I can specify that using the RGB function. So here I can specify an amount of red and green and blue. 
So each of these three parameters is allowed to accept a number between 0 and 255. And Essentially, that means there are 256 times 256 times 256 different colours that are achievable, which is the exact same as the range of numbers you're allowed to specify for RGB. So 0 to 60,777,215. Phew. Now, all that's really, really boring. All you really want to know probably at this point is how to change the colour. So let's just change this to, um, I'm going to go for 0 red and then 114 green and 198 blue. And then if I hit the F5 key to execute that, I'll end up with a very specific shade of blue that I can replicate using those specific settings. Now fortunately most of the other font formatting properties are slightly easier to apply. So for instance if I wanted to make the font bold, if I just throw a new line in the same width block, enter a new full stop and there's a property there called bold which I can essentially make equal to true or false. So if I go for equals MSO true that will make the font bold. Likewise for italic there's an italic property so I can say dot italic and I can make that equal to MSO true as well. I'll spell MSO properly, <laughs> there's an O in there somewhere. And then what else have I got? I've got basic things like the size of the font, so I can say dot size equals, and that's just the same point font size as you're used to, so I can set that up to a slightly higher value, let's set it up to say 16, and then I can change the font typeface as well, and I can do that by setting the font name. So if I wanted to make this equal to, currently it's Calibri, uh, I believe Calibri font, is that right? Yes, Calibri font. So if I wanted to make that equal to something like Arial or Comic Sans if I wanted to, then I can do that in the same sort of way as I, I saw earlier with the word art example. Let's set it to Arial. And then one more last quick one, let's set an underline style. So if I say dot underline style and then make that equal to, and I simply choose from a list, let's make it equal to a long line. There we go. So having done all of those things, if I were to just run the subroutine again, I'll get another slightly different type of formatting for that text. Now if you wanted to achieve the same sort of effect using text frame rather than text frame 2, there are a few subtle differences you should be aware of. Let's just make a quick copy of this procedure. In fact, I'm going to rename it first. Format basic text frame 2. And then let's make a copy of this and paste it in immediately down below. And then let's just rename this one so it's just called basic text frame. Then in the original one I'm going to delete the line which refers to the text frame. There's no point in that being there. And then in this example, the new one I've just copied, I'm going to delete the one that refers to text frame 2. I can then uncomment the text frame .characters text and let's pick another film name. Uh, the film that I watched before I watched Kung Fu Killer, the one that I watched prior to that, was... Um, oh, Star Trek Beyond. Oh, what an awful movie. Star Trek Beyond, if you haven't watched it, oh, don't bother. Even if you're a Trek fan, in fact, probably especially if you're a Trek fan, don't bother. It's just dreadful. I'd, oh, I can't describe how bad it is. I'd almost rather watch Twilight. No, I take that back. I'd never rather watch Twilight. Twilight's the worst, but um, it's pretty bad. Um, anyway, let's stick with that film name just for this example. I'll try to hide my disgust. And then what we will need to do, of course, here as well, is modify the property we're using for our width block. So rather than with text frame, of course, we're good, uh, with text frame 2, we need to say with text frame, or s.text frame. And then, of course, rather than text range, we need to refer to characters. So that's the property of the text frame that refers to the, 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 the text range, the equivalent of text range for text frame 2. Now, the color property is somewhat easier to use, actually, in a text frame. Rather than referring to the fill and the for color and the specific type of color you want to use, it's much simpler. For a text frame font, you just say color. <laughs> it's as easy as that. There actually is another property you can use. So color allows you all the same values available to the RGB property from text frame 2. So you've got the full range of 16.7 million colors. There is actually a separate property for color index, which you may be familiar with actually from having used Excel. If you try to format cells in Excel, you can use either color or color index. Now color index is effectively the equivalent of the scheme color that you could have used for text frame 2. It's a much more limited range of colours. Uh, colour index can be a number between 1 and 56. So you don't tend to find that used anymore unless you're back in the old legacy versions of Excel, like Excel 2003 or earlier. I'm going to stick with uh, the colour property and let's just make a few changes here, I guess. Let's set it up to just change things around a little bit so we can see an obviously different colour. So I'm going to go for 114 red, 0 green and 198 blue. 
Okay, the bold property is effectively the same as is italic, size and name. The underline style property is slightly different, however, so let's just remove that line. The underline property is effectively just underline this time. So I can say underline and make that equal to Sadly, I don't get any help with the underline property, but um, I can refer to one of the Excel underline constants. So it's an Excel underline style enumeration, which I can reference, and then if I enter a full stop after that, there's a whole list of different ones. Not quite as many as for the text frame 2 underline style, but nonetheless, we can apply something reasonably similar. Let's just go with a simple single underline. Okay, so having done all of that, we can run this subroutine and see we get roughly the same sorts of effects as with the text frame 2 property, just a few subtle differences to be aware of. Now it is also possible to format just part of the text within a text frame or a text frame 2. So let's in fact just scroll back up to the first procedure and what I'd like to do here is maybe if I run this one first, what I'd like to do perhaps is change the formatting of just the word killer inside the uh, the the text. So to make that work, let's copy and paste the width block and then I'm going to paste it in just down below. And this time, rather than referring to the entire text range, I want to refer to a subset of the characters of the text range. So in between text range and font, I can enter another full stop and then refer to the characters property within there. Then open a set of parentheses and then I can specify the starting position and the length of the string that I want to refer to. So if I set the start position to be character number, let's see, so it's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, character number nine, that's the starting position. And then the length of the string that I want to format is one, two, three, four, five, six, so that's the next six characters from number nine. Then I want to refer to the font property of that, and then I can make some changes to the rest of the formatting properties. So let's set the four color RGB to be RGB red, and then we'll make the bold true. I'm just gonna take the, maybe the bold and italic away from the original text in there and set the name to Arial for the first one. I'm going to set the name for the second font to be Chiller, which you may be familiar with. You can have a look at it in the uh, the font drop down list if you're not familiar with the, the Chiller font. Maybe I'll make the size a little bit larger as well, so let's set that, set that up to 20, and then I'll leave the underline style as it is. So in fact, I can take away the underline style. That's not necessary because I will already have changed it previously. So, having done all that, if I were to, to attempt to run that subroutine, you'll see this time I get Kung Fu Killer in a slightly different font with, for the word killer and a different colour. You might be able to make out that if I select that, that's uh, font size 20, while the rest of it is still font size 16. Probably could have done with a slightly larger font size again, but it's definitely changed all the other properties that I wanted. Now doing the same thing with the text frame property is pretty much identical. So if I scroll back down to the format basic text frame for Star Trek Beyond, and then let's have a quick look, what can, can we do here? Let's copy the width block again so we can make a few different changes. And again, it's using the characters, well, property, uh, sorry, big upon method this time rather than property. If I open up some round brackets there, you'll see that, again, I've got a start and a length parameter. So let's go with, I don't know, what should we do? Let's change the first four characters this time. So I'll start with one, comma, four, and then we can change the font color so that it's, let's go for RGB yellow, and then we can retain its bold. In fact, let's make the, uh, the, original text not bold or italic or in fact underlined so I'll take away all of those and then we'll just change the color bold italic size and name doesn't need to change because that's already been done so we can take that part away and we'll underline just the word star in that text as well so having done that if we were to just run the subroutine at that point you'll see the word star you can just about make that out I hope the word star is in um, yellow bold italic and underlined while the rest of it isn't When we created a text box and a label earlier on in the video, we saw that we could set the text orientation when we added the shape to the page. We can also modify that property for basic rectangles and other shapes, and we can change that property even after the shape has been created. Another thing we can do is change the text alignment, so we can centre it in the shape both vertically and horizontally. So let's have a quick look at how we can do that first with the text frame 2 property. If I scroll back up to the original routine in this module, and below the width blocks that we've already got in there, I'm going to add in another basic width block but this one's just going to say with s dot text frame 2 so in here what I can do in this width block is change a few basic properties I just add in my end width 
statement and then if I enter a full stop in there I can first of all set the orientation of the text so I'm going to say orientation and then I've, if I say equals I've got the full list of text orientations let's go with a downwards orientation like we saw earlier on to set the vertical and horizontal alignment there are slightly different properties for these depending on whether it's text frame 2 or text frame so for a text frame 2 what you're looking for is the horizontal anchor and the vertical anchor properties so horizontal anchor I'm going to set that to MSO anchor center and then vertical anchor is going to be equal to MSO anchor middle so having done that, if I were to run this subroutine again, I ought to find that Kung Fu Killer is now reading downwards and it's centered both vertically and horizontally in the shape. Achieving the same result with a text frame is pretty similar with again a couple of subtle differences. So let's start by copying and pasting the width block we've just written and we can paste that back into the other procedure. Then of course I want to refer to a text frame rather than a text frame too. The orientation property is identical with the exact same list of constants that we can use here as well, so it's the Microsoft Office constants. But we don't have horizontal anchor and vertical anchor properties. What we have instead is a horizontal alignment and a vertical alignment properties. And the constants we're allowed to use for those are slightly different as well, so we're not referring to the MSO constants anymore, we're referring to the some Excel constants. So let's go with Excel H Align Center for the horizontal alignment, and then for vertical alignment we can go with that will be equal to XLV align center. And then if I were to run that subroutine at this point, we'll end up with the same sort of effect, but with a text frame rather than a text frame two. Okay, so that's most of the useful basic properties that you can use to format text in both a text frame and a text frame two object. But there are also some additional properties that you can only apply to a text frame two. So let's just scroll back up to the first subroutine in this module and I'm going to make a copy of this. I'm going to select all the text and copy it and then paste it in down towards the bottom of the module. Let's modify its name so we'll call this something like basic uh, formats basic text frame two additional and then let's make a few simple modifications to make it easier to work with. I'm going to remove the entire second width block that formats just the word killer. So let's take that part away completely. And then I'm just going to quickly modify the orientation property. I don't want it to orient the text downwards. I want it to be just the regular uh, sort of um, horizontal alignment. Sorry, big one, horizontal orientations. So let's take away that. But I do want the text to be centered in the shape. I'll increase the font size a little bit here as well, so it's up to about 20. And then within here, what I'd like to do, in fact, I'm also going to take away the underline style as well, just to make things a little neater and tidier. But within this main width block, so I'm already formatting the font of the text range of text frame two of the shape. What I'd also like to do is then affect the glow property of the font. Now, if you watched the previous video on formatting shapes, you'll already be familiar with the glow effect. So I'm going to say with dot glow and then another end width within my original width block. And then within the glow width block, I can set three different properties. First of all, the color property. I'm gonna use the RGB setting for the color of the glow effect. And I'll make that equal to something, let's say RGB hot pink, for instance. And then I can enter another full stop within that width block and refer to the radius. So this is set by a, a value of points. So the, uh, the number of points away from the text that you want the glow effect to spread to so let's set that to something like I don't know let's set it to eight points let's go to ten and then one more let's set uh, dot transparency so I'm going to set the transparency to be 0 0.25 so that's done as a percentage so having done all of that if I were to run that subroutine now you'll see that I get the same text in the text box centered but I've got this sort of pink glow effect all the way around the outside of the text I'm not saying that's meant to look particularly attractive by the way this is more showing you the basic principle that you can apply this the, the effect that I've created here is pretty horrible but just to demonstrate that you can do this in a slightly simpler fashion, we can also add a reflection effect to the text. So again, I don't need a width block to do this. There's only one single property to change. But with the font, I can refer to the reflection property. And then I can refer to the type of reflection effect that I want to add. And then I simply select from a list of different choices. I'm going to go with a reflection effect type 9. So if I set that to type 9 and then give that a quick test, I'll see that this time the text is reflected using um, the preset reflection effects for that reflection type. We can also set up a shadow effect for the text in the shape as well. So again, I'm going to use a width block for this because there are quite a few sub properties of the shadow effect. So I'm going to say width dot shadow and then another end width. 
and then inside that width block I can refer to the various properties of the shadow object. So let's start first of all with a shadow type. So I'm going to say dot type equals and again I can choose from a list of preset values. Let's go with I don't know, let's go with MSO shadow 20 to begin with. If I just run that subroutine at that point you'll see the shadow pretty much obscures the reflection effect. So you might want to avoid using the uh, the preset types and you might want to set up your own shadows instead. So rather than a type what we're going to do is refer to a style first of all. So I'm going to set the shadow style to be equal to an MSO outer shadow and then I'm going to do the blur effect. So I'm going to set the blur to be equal to let's say a blur of five and then I'm going to set a transparency of 0 0.25 then I'm going to set an offset x which is the distance in points offset um, horizontally so towards the right from the left hand edge of the shape so dot offset x equals let's set that to 10 and then say dot offset y equals 10 and that's again a distance in points that's offset from the shape then let's have a color so I can say dot four color dot RGB equals and I'm going to go for a preset color RGB light gray this time okay so having done all of that let's give that one a quick look if I run hit F5 at that point you might just about be able to make out the shadow effect that's sitting in the background of the shape might be more sensible to remove the reflection type first of all and then run that one again and then it's probably slightly easier to see the, the subtle shadow effect sitting in the background there if you like what you've seen here, why not head over to the YSL website where you can find loads more free resources including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching, see you next time.